So this is number one and this is number two. Yeah, yeah. but that should be uh, doing something, but it's not doing it at all, okay? That's fine. You already have your belts and your braces, so. <laughs> My fly's open now. <laughs> As Churchill is reputed to have said, it is no matter. The dead bird does not leave the nest. Nice. Okay, well, let's just go with what we've got. David Mitchell, welcome to the Bibliophile once again. It's a pleasure to be here, Nigel. Thank you. Also, once again. This time in Cork, Ireland, near your abode. Yeah, yeah, the fair city of Cork, the real capital of Ireland. We're in West Cork, about an hour's drive west of here, but this is the main city where we come when we want a taste of the city life. And we just have had a taste of some good food. That was a nice lunch, wasn't it? Yes, yes. Uh, warmed us up for for a conversation about well f- I've got four questions for you four simple questions oh, what do you do how do you do it why do you do it and why does it matter whoa Okay, I'll have to come. I'll, I'll, I'll have to circle back to two, three, and four. But what do I do? I write novels. I try to understand things about people and the world we're in. I try to understand. It is demonstrably a, a world of many adjectives. So many adjectives, and I guess each one's a different colour and. I like to look at spe- spectroscope. What's what's the adverb of that? Spect- spectrographically, uh, something in the neck of the woods. I try to look at these colours: um, melancholy, envy, anger, ambition, greed. All these maybe periodic table is a better metaphor, but all these elements that make up the human a human being. Mm-hmm. Uh, the human heart, the human soul, the human mind, and their, maybe their, their related elements that make up the human condition, the, the human experience. What is it? Um, why do we respond how we respond? What is a life? Um, what is our relationship to the other people we live here with? So you're observing? Yes, and recording, observe. bearing witness. Yes, and yes. I guess you can't record unless you observe. Uh, and then, I, well, I need to translate it into language, into the you can understand, I guess, mm. without then proceeding to write about it. But it's my job to both understand and then to try to express my understandings in in English. And how do you get that understanding? Listening, thinking, reading, research, research. I'm not sure if there's a line between formal research and having a conversation or accidentally overhearing something on the radio. Uh, If you're conscious, then you are researching either directly Mm -hmm. in in an archive, in a library, on YouTube, or indirectly. Just being alive is, is, is already researching what it is to be a human. Then I have to assemble these understandings uh, in a form into the architecture of of a narrative. Otherwise, it's just one damn thing after another, one damn observation after another. Uh, right. It needs to, I need to deploy uh, the tricks of narrative to make a compelling one uh, so that when you read my understandings, you're also just swept along and maybe addicted to uh, the plot that I'm trying to push on you and the people in it Um, so you're trying to get people to pay attention to your wisdom oh that's quite aggrandizing isn't it um how dare i say yes to that (laughs) um i'd I'd like to, to start this question again from a different direction 
I'm satisfying a compulsion I have to make narrative, uh, or maybe we're into why I do it. But and I, I think it's maybe not divorceable from what I do. I feel an urge to make narrative. Uh, it's a strong urge. I get antsy and unhappy and irritable and plagued by the thought that I've wasted my day if I don't spend a part of it trying to make a narrative with people in, mm. with ideas in, with story in. It, it, it's, uh, it's a bit too precious to say, oh, I have to do this. I just want to. I want to do it really badly. Mm. Uh, so I do it. And <laughs> to make these, I hope, worthwhile, worthy of other people's attention, maybe worthy of my own attention, they've got to be good. And mm. they've got to have ideas and these, I, I need a better word, but understandings in them as a prerequisite for, the, for them to be worthy of, of, of other people's attention. So you're, you want to help people be more interesting? Um, that is not high on my totem pole of what I do or why I do it. Maybe it's more selfish than this. I need to make narrative. Thank heavens for me and for my dependents. Uh, there's a market in this. Yeah. They've got to be good to be able to sort of compete in that market. I know that there's lots of other great ones out there. Uh, so mine have to be a certain standard. Um, if they are of the kind that make me feel a little bit smarter, that make me feel as if I've nourished my mind with some new insights or new ways of seeing things, mm -hmm. uh, if they are of, of that level, then they have a chance of being able to compete. People, people might want to buy them. People might want them. I want to make them that good anyway. I make a piece of art. And I try to make it as good as I can. That's what I do. And hopefully other people are going to be interested in it as well. Um, but that's what I do. And I want to learn from each of them how to make the next one better. And learn from other people how to make one, the next one better along the... Um, I can't remember if it was Napoleon or... Ch no, it was Napoleon. Um... I like generals who learn from their mistakes, but I like mm. generals more when they learn from other people's mistakes. He said something like that. Or I prefer to learn from other people's mistakes. It's not necessarily mistakes. It isn't mistakes at all in, in, in this case. In fact, I might want to uh, scrub that last quote. Sure. Because it's really about reading other people's novels and becoming enfolded by other people's works of art and thinking, wow, this is amazing. Why is this so amazing? Right. I'll, I'll have a bit of that, please. So that's oh how and what have rather bled together there, but maybe that's the nature of the undertaking. What's the line between the what and the how? Maybe it's not always that clear. Mm -hmm. Over. Do you get sick and tired of talking about it? No, I don't do this very often. Uh, <laughs> uh, ask me at the end of a three-week US book tour, and <laughs> my no will be a little more forced. But right now, it's a pleasure. This isn't really an interview, it's a joint exploration. Who doesn't like a joint exploration with such excellent company? Oh, goodness, yes. Okay, there's a book that I've been reading lately. It's called A Writer's Workshop by Stephen Koch. And uh, I just want to just take a few quotes out of it and run the past year. Just because there's good stuff in it. Begin with whatever gives you the impetus to begin. An image, a fantasy, a situation, a memory, a motion, a set of people, anything at all that arouses your imagination. So you, you've talked about ideas being important. Do you search out interesting ideas and then run them through your imagination? Is that what you did? Yes. I'm hesitating because it feels a little more like I don't really search them out. It's as in this quote by Mr. Coach. You've got to start with something somewhere. It might just end up being a bit of scaffolding you never look at again, but you've got to start with somewhere to sort of 
open the door of the blank page and it's the list that you just read out any one of these um, a situation uh, a character in a situation and you just imagine if you were them what would you be thinking what would you be feeling what would you be smelling what would you be thinking and you get a few lines of that and suddenly you've sort of got a crowbar you can jemmy open the uh, the blankness and then you're through and that might be your scene it might not be your scene it might just be another door that you need to get through to get to the real one it doesn't matter but you're working you're not just looking at the blank page yeah uh, now in all this sort of jemming doors open and skateboard skateboard <laughs> uh, in all this jemming open you'll find ideas I'm riding an old character that I'm bringing back to life for, 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 for a new thing I'm working on this morning. His brother died when the character was about 16 and the brother was about 20, 21. Uh, and I just came across the idea that you can outrun or outfox or outshake a presence, but you can't outrun or outfox or shake off an absence. So the character's yeah. brother is with him as much now, even half a century later, than he was when he was alive. You can't exorcise someone who's not there. You can't tell them to leave you alone. You don't do any of that. They're there, and there's memories of him are, 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 are a part of him. Now, this isn't, sort of, I'm not saying this is a superbly profound, blindingly original idea. It's not, but, but it was for the scene, and I found it by thinking what it'd be like to be this guy who's about my age now, thinking back to when he was a kid. Uh, and, and I found that idea. And that idea, can also sort of, it's got little sh offshoots and sort of hyperlinks le le leaping off it that I'm, that, that I'm going to click on and go to. Um, so I don't really start with the idea. Uh, it's more the character, actually. Mm, okay. Uh, I, I'm not sure exactly... What exactly what you're trying to do? You're just exercising your imagination and writing because you can't help but do anything else? Um, I'd say I, I'm, I'm not not bearing witness to the world and to the human heart and this messy business called life and relationships. I'm not not bearing witness, but that's probably not my... It's not my prime motivator. I'm scratching the, this itch that I'm unhappy if I don't scratch. Right. Um, it's got to be a good sentence. I've got yeah. to write a sentence that is true and pure and appropriate to its thinker or its speaker if it's dialogue. It's got to be worth saying. Mm. It's got to be better than life, does it? Better than what you might normally hear on the street or from a friend? There are times when it is impossible for anything to be better than life. Uh, there are times when, where, where, where true fidelity to life would kill your narrative because you need some conflict here, because you need some mm. space, you need some pace here, because you need a little moment to reflect here. However, whatever is a Whatever you discover the narrative needs most here, at a sentence level, uh, that is it. And to, to find that, to write that, to net it, to capture that in words, to enter into a deal with it so you can represent it in words, a bit like you went in, into a deal with your interviewees to make this thing that we're making now. Enter into a deal with it. And when that deal is honoured and kept and when you've got a sentence that is just, if it needs to be flashy, then it should be flashy. If it needs to be muted and minimal, and it is that, then you've won. If mm. it needs to be something else, and it is that, then you've won. It's apt. It's apt. Apt. That is a great word. 
and and you take great satisfaction in nothing's better. It's right. Like, yeah, yeah. Right. It's it's really it's a great feeling. And you, so really, it's a pleasure principle that's at work here. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, I think it is. Okay. Uh, now the pleasure can involve pain, but there's but hey, <laughs> but but don't you also it. then? I mean, you've done it for yourself. Now you want other people to appreciate how good it is. They do. Yeah, they do. You've got uh, some really good fans. Yeah, I'm lucky, uh, and I just notice when other people do it to me, I appreciate it. Mm. I'm not doing the right of a favour. Uh, no. There's a beautiful line that uh, any one of a gazillion writers might have made. But um, let's pick on dead people. But a Chekhov and his translators make a fantastically apt line. No. Uh, and that is not a wasted day. And you've got a story or a scene, you go for a story with quite a lot of them in and scenes that just fit together and flow unexpectedly looking forwards and absolutely inevitably and perfectly and how could it be any other way looking backwards mm -hmm. I spend an hour in the presence of a story like that I don't want that hour back I feel richer yeah. and yeah. nourished mm. it's the opposite of one of those three star shows on Amazon of which there were so so many and they aren't bad they're not even bad they're just I want my time back. Yeah. And you're well, never going to get it back. Isn't that... Great fiction is the opposite of that. Right. You don't want your time back. No, you feel it's time well spent and you, as you say, you feel really good about having just read it. Yeah, yeah. You feel richer. It's like a kid and you've got no money and every pound, every 50p, every 10p, is your, it shines and you know where it is and it's, it sort of insulates you from not having any... Uh, and great piece of fiction it just insulates me from mm. a life without any in it I feel mm. protected and rich and fortified I feel I understand people and life a little bit better in this respect where it was apt to the characters I get that knowledge for nothing I get it for free or kind of the price of my time and, and, yeah. and, and, and whatever I paid for the book but I, I don't think about that really but. you get joy out of getting that knowledge yeah yeah they knew. So I know this works when I'm on the receiving end. So yeah. it's not such a stretch. And I don't think it's arrogant to, um, to have a little bit of confidence that it's going to work when you're on the giving end as well. See, so what I'm trying to do is just to sort of get a, a handle on, on what's happening with the book in our age and how writing might be defined in this age. Um, what you're doing is, it's popular. There's an audience for it. And so I wonder why that is. Touch wood. Um, uh, I might not be a good person to answer this. I guess I can co-speculate. Um, you sort of need to ask my readers, I suppose. Guess then. I make a world that has moving parts and is people and that they can recognize too over the over the, throughout your over right and it maybe has rides like in a fun fair it has rides they want to go on and they go through them and they get i hope thrills and wonder and thought and maybe it's like some bizarre theme park where where you usher people in and here's a noisy scary room and here's well done, here's a bit where you can just sit down and look at something beautiful and move into the next room. Well, the person that was in the noisy room, well, they aren't who you thought they were. Maybe it's like devising a sort of a, uh, some sort of theme park escape room experience. Uh, and I, they're just fun to be in. Uh, and they're more, they're more interactive than, than, than dominant narrative form of our day which is the Netflix show if, if, you, if you could somehow count it probably more people have watched Breaking Bad than have consumed any narrative in any other form of narrative or, or, or Avatar or, or, or these sort of 
blockbuster films. If you could possibly count it, I think that would be the dominant art form. The novel's niche. But, but you need it to create niche. the other kind of artwork. Right? I mean, that's another question I have, is your work being turned into another form of art. What's that like? Well, first I'll go with honour. Uh, it's an yeah. honour. Yeah. Uh, some artist is going to... A director. A little local colour. Uh, some other artist is going to dedicate two or three working years yes. to this project, he or yeah. she or they. And uh, They're placing a bet on it too by yeah. putting money up. And, and, yeah, the producers are. So that's an honour. The financiers, yeah. Just tying back slightly to the last point, it, it's, it's related but it's different, uh, depending on whether it's a more cerebral film or less cerebral film it's going to be more or less interactive uh, in that the audience is going to ask, be asked to do more or less in terms of thinking about what they're seeing however compared to a novel it's always less you have to work harder when you're reading a novel slightly depending on the form of the novel but you still are you're sitting down and concentrating and it's not a screen and you're in charge of the time through which you're experiencing it Plus, the, got think. The, your imagination is way more, uh, obviously, engaged. It is. I think this is a part of the craft. The, the better written it is, the more effortless it seems to consume yes. it. Yes. And yes. yet, yes. you are still working. It's just you don't know... It's more like you're being hacked uh, in a benign way. A great piece of writing will hack your imagination and give you the illusion that you're experiencing it. It's somehow different and more indirect than than a film narrative. Uh, there it's exquisitely passive or wearingly, wearingly passive, depending on whether you're enjoying the experience or not. It's, even when the hacking is superb, in the case of the printed word on a page, it's always active. Um, and I kind of like that. Uh, yes, it's niche, but it's my niche, and I'm at home here. And mm. and, and, and six-figure, sometimes occasionally seven-figure audiences on both sides of the Atlantic and in other reading territories are into this. And hey, mm. if you can reach enough of them, then and you're lucky, and you ideally get good at what you're doing, then maybe you can earn a living from it. And I'm in that really fortunate position. So yeah. far, touch wood, take nothing for granted. But. I, I've forgotten if I've strayed outside the four questions. What you do, I've got a fairly good handle on that. How you do it is a big, these are big, big, I know these are big, big topics, but uh, it's just good to, to, I like to know. Paper. Yeah. Um, let me have a crack at the how, because it changes. It changed from when I was starting out. Impetuous, throw myself at it. Throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. Just write and write and write and write. And with, with very little self-consciousness about whether it might be any good or not, whether anyone other than my mum would ever want to read it or not, it felt easier. <laughs> right. Looking back at my earlier books, I don't think they were as good as the stuff I'm doing now. Right. But, God, I could knock out a book in 11 months and, hey, it would do pretty well. This is all right. Jesus, now it takes me 11 months just to get the names right. <laughs> it takes forever. Right. Uh, it, it sort of... And why is that? You're over. Are you overthinking? Are you? You're not being as spontaneous. You're relying too much on research and not enough on imagination, or what? Yeah. Why? Um, why indeed? There's answers that show me in a less positive light, and answers that show me in a more flattering light. The less positive ones. Yeah, I'm overthinking it. My mortgage is paid. Uh, I'm not. Motivated by the by not knowing where rent in three or four months is going to come from, that gets you writing like nobody yes. is. This, I tell you. Yes. Um, what else? You're too fat then. Um, that's a less flattering answer, and and it's not not true. Uh, I'll just in um, the infests of my self-esteem and mental health are gone to more flattering answers. Uh, I think I know what I'm doing more. I think I yeah. know not to 
use imagery and metaphor unless I know it's really damn good. If it's not really damn good, then don't use it. I think I know, I've got a clear idea when to start and when to stop a scene. I have a strong idea of voice. I've always been okay on voice, but I'm more fine-tuned now than I've ever been because I'm older and I've thought more and listened to more voices. I've read more. You're wiser. Yeah. Uh, if you're English and self-deprecating, you can't use that adjective about yourself, but I hope so. I'd better be, otherwise what have I been doing all these years? Yeah. So uh, so this makes the bar higher, so it's my standards higher, and this means scenes fall short. I'll go back to less flattering. I forget the basics. I sometimes forget, I'll oh, just get the damn thing down. Don't worry about making it perfect, just get the damn thing down. I forget that too often. Um, yeah, that's the thing. It's It's getting it out and getting it down and then reworking it, right? Making something that is fixable rather than and not trying to make perfection on the first pass. Yeah. yeah I yeah. forget that. And I should but I do. Um, yeah, it doesn't matter how shitty it is the first time around. Mm -hmm. Yes, I am nodding here. And then three weeks I've been working I, I will have noticed I've been working on the same damn scene for a week and it's gone nowhere and new uh, scene fresh uh, yeah, 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 yeah yeah um and yeah. you can polish and polish and polish until all you are left with is gleam and yes it's very gleamy but no one gives a damn about gleam you give a damn about character and mm -hmm. emotion and so yeah uh I forget but I'll try and forget less. Maybe as a result of this conversation, it's good to think about the hydrogen and the helium of my, of my periodic table of writing. It's, it's, it's good to think about the basics again. Mm. Just because it isn't a common sense, a misnomer. It's, it, it's not common at all. And often the basics is also a misnomer. They're not really basics. They're just um, the more fundamentals in the sense of them being invisible and underfoot. Um, so it's good to remember. Uh, that's the, uh, so I was answering, I was, I was working on the how then. So yeah, I, I was just saying how I work changes. It could also change project by project, book by book. If a character already exists, then I'll go about it a little bit differently. It's like meeting an old friend and having a catch up than sort of being God at the start of the book of Genesis and saying, let there, let there be light on everything. And you have to name everything and know what all the moving parts are, because you have to devise them afresh. That's a different methodology than, than, than if you're hopping back into a house that you built 10 or 20 years ago, the house being a character of their life. And I want to find new ways. Uh, I don't want to stagnate. I want to take myself to the edge of what I'm capable of and get that feeling where you're thinking, I don't know if this is working or not. This, I might hand this into my agent and they will say, what, uh, uh, I think you need, um, I think you need to find an, uh, a new agent or my, or I'm on the feeling when I'm handing something into my editor and, 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 and there's an ominous pause for three and four days before they get back to you thinking, God, have I done it this time? Have I gone too far? <laughs> I kind of want that feeling. Yes, yeah, uh, risk, risk. Or... Yeah, uh, such a fine line between being, innovative at least for you and coming crashing down in flames because it's not working but I, but I want to be on that line mm. I don't want to I don't want my work to feel lazy I don't want if it if it's too effortless if, if you're not kind of bleeding for the blues and if it's too effortless and then it's going to read like an effortless book mm -hmm. and we've when you and I find a book like that, we probably stop reading it. Again, it's not bad. It's just... Uh, well, it's okay. just, yeah, you can spend your time doing things that are more, what? Yeah. Like vitalizing yeah. Yeah. or yeah. Uh, enjoyable? Yeah. I'm 54. I, um, a few of my fr or a few friends and acquaintances have passed. I yeah. can't take time for granted anymore. And, and uh, Both as a reader and, and as a writer. So... Let's make this one count. Let's make this scene count. Let's make it really damn good mm -hmm. and edgy and apt. I love that word, apt. Yeah, it's uh, nice. Must be, it must be linked to aptitude. Wrapped. Wrapped. Enrapturable. Yeah. As both the subject and the object. 
I did warn you I was a word nerd. I love this stuff. So why do you do this again? You just don't have a choice. Because that's the, stand, that's the answer I get from most authors I talk to is that they, they just have to do it. At best, I can give you a variation on that theme, yeah. but, but it would be disingenuous also to say that uh, to dream up another one because mm. I felt the need to. No, uh, I, I just, it does not feel like a day well lived if I don't get a decent scene out of it. Weeks and months of those days, ditto. They're not, that is, that, that, um, my life well lived is one where I make cool scenes or mm, mm. disturbing scenes or true mm. scenes or mm. apt scenes or pure scenes or vital scenes. Lots of them that are connected in ways that build a narrative. That just feels great. It's yeah. fulfilling. It's satisfying yourself. Yes. Self-gratification. And uh, the other default spin-off consequences of that are exactly that. Uh, they're spin-offs from, 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 from that core self-gratification. Right. And it's just a question then of making sure that you spend as much time doing that as you can until you die. Yes, please. I also understand that you need to do... To feed that, you need to spend time doing things that are not that. So I also need to go for a walk and play chess.com and the occasional PlayStation 5 game and watch films and have conversations and walk around cities I've never visited before and meet people that both who I've never met before and who are of a type that I've never met before yeah. and try to understand the world as best I can. So that fe uh, this feeds into writing. So I need to do that too, mm. right? And, and to continue to try to evolve as a writer, I have to do things that aren't writing. To simulate the experience of being young when everything is new, when, when, when every yeah. single street, when every single person you meet is a new type, when every new lover you might enjoy with is a new type of lover, etc., etc. That, that, that's, um, I'm giving the false impression of being some Lothario here. I wasn't, alas. However, um, when you're young, you get this by default. Everything is new. Uh, Middle-aged, you've got to sort of simulate it. You have to enable these new experiences mm -hmm. and be open to them and be open and thoughtful about them. And then it can be new source material. Uh, and it might also reshape or refashion or reboot how you work. Mm. Um, yeah, I think that's true. So what do you want out of your life? Um, as a human being, I want to be a good father and a good friend and a good partner to my wife and to care for them well and whatever would pass as successfully. Uh, as a writer, I want to learn how to continue to be the best writer I can possibly be, whatever that means, and explore what that might mean. Uh, and those two are clearly symbiotic. Without being a good human, I don't think I can be the best writer I can be. The writer nourishes financially, but existentially as well, the human that I am. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we are one. <laughs> that sounds like a bad line. For it's the so sci -fi funny film. because I just talked with John Banville yesterday, and oh, he said the opposite. Did he? He I said, he "I'm non-human when I'm writing. I'm a non-human. I'm a John Banville, you know, when I'm not writing. But the, the, it's completely removed." <sighs> Uh, I'm going to listen to the full conversation because context is everything. Yeah. Uh, um, those books you wrote about the scientists, I, I, uh, I read those at a very impressionable age and wow, they made a deep impression. They were the first thing I ever read where every word, every line, 
mm. was considered and thought about, and I could feel the care that had got, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say love that had gone in. It's, it sounds cheesy, but it, it, it's, it's the only word he loves language. He mm. loves it. Yes. Uh, well, he said he famously said that he would give the life of one of his children for. for that doesn't sound like you know this, this kind of moral, caring person that you are. He would give the life of a, one of his children to produce the greatest sentence ever written. Now he may have been pulling our legs with that, but uh, I, I know there's a certain truth in it. I'm sure uh, it's a certain truth and that is an expression of zeal uh, and, <laughs> and I mean, it's not not true that there needs to be a splinter of ice or a shard of ice in the heart of every writer it's not not true that you need to kill your darlings that you need to um in, in the literary abyss um in that in that zone what you wouldn't do to someone you're walking, the, to, to, to a member of the public walking down Patrick Street in, uh, in Cork. Uh, so that dichotomy, it's metaphorically bang on. Uh, however, I've never felt that me the human is in competition with me the writer. Mm -hmm. I've never felt that... It's, it's the same it, person. Yeah. Uh, just different aspects of values and particularly um, yeah I think so um, mm. I would also see that I also sort of acknowledge that, that this that, that this might not be true for everybody oh yeah, uh, yeah. Um, I've never felt that my kids are robbing me of time that I should be spending writing because even when they literally were because they were five months old and were very high maintenance, as are we all at that age. I was thinking, well, at least I'm worried about kids now. At least, well, I, I mean, there's no at least. I, I take at least out of that. I'm thinking, hey, great, I can write about this pretty fundamental human experience. Uh, not everyone has, and lives well lived can be lived, of course, without kids. It's just, it so happens it's a fairly a common part of the human experience that connects you with the world in a particular way and great, now I can write about it and whatever time I need to be spending on you kids uh, it's worth it, mm. artistically it's worth it, let alone as a human, as a kind of existentially speaking so no uh, yeah, uh, uh, sorry, no, yeah, no yeah. Um, the writer me and the me me are one, I don't think of us as uh, separate in, mm. in a but one feeds the Chicken other in terms of yes. a life well lived. Yes, it's yes, they do. Yeah, they do deals with each other. They give each other time and do each other solids, as I understand the kids say. Uh, and <laughs> yeah, they do deals with each other, and and they are mutually beneficial deals. And I wouldn't want it any other way, please. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So again, aside from the writing, what's a, a life well lived is caring for the people you love. What else? Uh, um, improving the world when and where you can. Um, how? Specialize in what life is in the cards that life has already dealt you. Uh, my son's autistic. Uh, a life well lived is changing the world in ways that make the world more autism friendly. Uh, that's that's one th way I'd like to spend. And this is what you've it. done with this, this Japanese book, where you translated a really helpful book, right? Yeah, yeah. The reason I jumped by now, Kihigashida, it was really helpful to my wife and I. But it was in Japanese. We translated that. Actually, our reasoning in the beginning wasn't that altruistic we just wanted the people who were looking after our son to right. read this because you, yeah. you've got to read this you yes. can't think about autism the same way afterwards that sounds like a great book though like oh. a valuable book it was and it's just a start it isn't going to um change the law so that there is greater supervision of abuse situations that happen in uh institutions where vulnerable adults are housed, for example. Uh, you need more than to translate a book. You need to, you need to get engaged at a political level.
And that's part of a, a life well lived then? Are you doing that or not? You've not only got a certain amount of time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you have to pick your battles and, mm. and, 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 and pick ones that you have the resources, intellectual and otherwise, to have, de- to have a decent chance of winning. Mm. Uh, I just plucked that example out of thin air as something I want to do more in the future. Uh, but, 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 but there are others. You just kind of know uh, what causes are important to you. Um, mm. They're things that have impacted your own life. Yeah. You go with those, don't you? Um, yeah, you, and you look at things that you think are not just and, and yeah. that, that, that get you uh, emotionally engaged. The great Homer Simpson can be a useful reverse role model. And when Homer ran to be the mayor of Springfield, <laughs> his election slogan was, why can't somebody else do it? Okay, well, don't be Homer Simpson. <laughs> like, if you want to live your life well. <laughs> right, don't be him. <laughs> um, <laughs> in some ways, he's loyal and trusting and, and all sorts of wonderful qualities as well that are worth emulating. But, uh, and he loves his kids pretty much come what may. But, um, so how, do, you, how do books how do books enable you to contribute to the world then? As a reader, they inform me as a writer and I hope make me a better writer. As a writer, my books, um, uh, out they go. Uh, and where they fall and how they grow and how they take root and how they move people or fail to move people, it's the parable of the sower, isn't it? Um, I, 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 I feel it's almost sort of a question you want to ask 500 people who've read one of my books and I think you'd get a more representative true yeah. app to answer than the one I can sort of stumblingly give but if I were to... No, no, but just if about, I were... about the, the fact that, that your writing is distributed this way is it in a, in a book form like for, I suppose, you know the, the cover of Utopia Avenue which I really, really like uh, I love the, the choice of colours the, the, the orange and the sort of this really bold orange and, a, and a, almost a red and then a, a less bold orange. It's just it's so striking. It's pleasing. And it's pleasing. And then this, this uh, black and white sort of from, from below photograph of these 60s swingers or whatever you want to call them. Yeah. Cool. But you can get that on the screen. I don't know, but I just love, and I love the end papers on this too. Like on a paperback, you've got, you've got these beautiful end papers. I, I don't know. You're touching it. It's tactile, and tactility has a certain, has a certain magic. Um, isn't it cool that Taylor Swift bought uh, one of the last record produ- uh, record production units, uh, and her last album. Um, I think the figure that's coming to me is 800,000. Um, LPs? Uh, LPs. Yeah. A uh, reasonable chunk of all the LPs that sold last year were hers that she pressed in, well, her people uh, pressed in a factory. It's tactile. Now, you get that music prob- these days in, in, in a much more convenient um, form. It sounds great, probably, depending on your speakers and how much you spent on, on, on these things. But... Mm. But Swifties, uh, if I can say us Swifties, <laughs> we like the artifact. You want it. Well, this, you know what? There's such a collector culture still alive. I certainly in Prague, wherever I go to a used bookstore, there's a section for LPs, and it's crowded. Uh, there is something holy about them. Uh, that's the word. There's something holy. They they they, they have a holy aura. You connect with the art. Mm-hmm. with the artist, with their mind, via an object in a way that does, just doesn't cut it when you try and do it in essentially ones and zeros in a digital file. Mm-hmm. Um, why is it a profound question, but it's something to do with ritual and it's something atavistic mm-hmm. and holy and, is it, is it avatar but atavistic? There's something ancient about art through an object that you don't get 
that that that, that, that somehow it eludes the net of a digital screen mm-hmm. uh, or a digital format. And it's kids who do this as well. It's not just people of, of our generation who remember the analog world. No, um, no. And I love that. Yeah. Okay. So, but uh, the book itself then. Um, any comments on uh, your relationship to to it? First, I'm a reader, and they contribute to a, my life well lived and my mind well used. Uh, secondly, as a writer, um, love Nigel. I love it. I. I care for it. I'm entranced by it. Love's a spectrum, uh, a four-dimensional spectrum. It's not just left and right. It, it, it's, it, it, it pulsates and oscillates and exists in time, like love does. Compare the early stages of a fine romance with a 20-year marriage when, when there's this sort of gruff affection. Um, similarly, my relationship with, with the book it's um I care for it. Sometimes I'm passionately engaged with the book and I will lie to loved ones to carve out a little extra time because I've got to finish this chapter. I have to finish the chapter. I've had a book um it it, 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 it was allegedly a children's book, but like all the best children's books, nah, it wasn't really. It, it's, it's called Good Night Mr. Tom by Madeline Someone it won the it, it's set. It, it's it's a couple of evacuees in the, some village in the deep English countryside in 1940 or so, at the start of the phony war, and just brilliant. And I read it. And of course, all books are different, but that feeling of of, of being utterly enveloped by a book and. I'm going to have to change the shape of my day to find out what happens next. Yeah. That's the same feeling, whether it's Chekhov or, 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 or Goodnight Mr. Tom by Madeline, someone whose name I'm afraid I forgot. It was perfect. Not, it was perfect. It glowed. Not everything was perfect. Every decision. It was unexpected as you were reading it. It had this beautiful, tragic, uplifting, glorious logic when you look back at the decisions that have been made to write it. Just amazing. God, what a book. Um, I love it. Isn't, uh, isn't that like love, though? It's like you pour yourself mm-hmm. into, into that other person. You, you, uh, you're, they are a reflection of everything that you want in another person. And, you're, and you, you communicate with, with that sort of almost ideal. Yeah. Um, and you're right to be a little cautious about the ideal because it is a form of intoxication uh, and it's kinder to the later manifestations of that love to remember that in the early stages yeah. so you don't hold it against them when that changes it's not their fault it's yeah. you were drugged you were both drugged yeah. nature was doing a number one yeah. Yeah. and a book, can, a book you can feel somewhat similar can yeah. you? Go ahead and drug me. I know it's words on the page. I know it's artifice. I know this character isn't really real. I know they're figments of your imagination. I don't care. Yeah. Drug me. <laughs> yeah. Drug me, baby. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, well, bibliophilia. Uh, the bibliophile. What does mm. that remind me of? Love. Possession too, though, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, possession's a part of love. I guess, the, I guess that's a two-way street. Love is a part of possession, probably, but it's healthier the first way around. It's many things. Uh, love and bibliophilia. Uh, it's sort of textual counterpart. Textual intercourse. I have to get the pun in. Ooh. Uh, thank you. Very uh, good. Well, uh, is that fresh? Is that uh, new? Is that uh, fresh off the press? Uh, it's, it's, been... it's an old one that I have in, in a hidden holster that I occasionally oh, pull well, out of the I, fire. I, but um, I, I think this is true of all the best stuff, of all the best art. Uh, it's got love in it. 
uh, it, it, I, I can't make it not sound cheesy, but I yeah. think it's true in all of the arts. But love in the making of it? Love in the appreciation of it? What? If it is in the making of it, uh, I mean, it needs to be other things as well. Otherwise, it risks just being sentimental. But love in its various forms, from hot passion to respect uh, and to yeah. decency and kindness and the tough love where you got to tell people things they might not want to hear, but what's the alternative? You're going to let them live in illusion prison for the rest of their lives. Like, that's not really love, is it? Um, mm. So it's not always warm and fluffy, but art with love in it, I think, distinguishes itself from the rest. I think it's greater, and I think the rest is lesser. I, I know I'm being a little vague here, but we're on the edge of sort of what mm. makes sense and what doesn't. But mm -hmm. but I think what we're discussing is not bullshit. I think it's uh, I think it's true, even though it's hard to make it kind of sound laser focused. Um, love is something to do with art, and you feel it, and people feel it, and you know you've got it when people who don't normally consume that art form are consuming it. Why? I think it's because they're responding to love, to the love that it was made with, to the love that it is about, to the love that it houses. I, yeah, I think when, uh, in a beautifully produced book, you, you get a lot of that. You get admiration, you get uh, reverence for the, the actual, the, the hard work that's gone into it. Yeah. And... Uh, Hopefully. And, you, and that in, in turn, you, I think you want to possess it because it's, it's precious, it's beautiful. Mm. Wholesome, and you feel stronger after it. Uh, I know there's some great art that sort of, well, there's some good art that, 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 that deliberately sort of embraces the grotesque. That, 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 mm. Uh, mm. And you don't have a thing without its opposite. So, so, uh, a novel that is all love is, would be probably unreadable. It, 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 it sort of needs the dark for the light to be light. Otherwise, it's just an attack on your eyeballs. Um, however, art that's created with this sensibility. Mm -hmm. I don't want someone to read my book and then just feel miserable and depressed because, as so often happens in the real world, sort of the people you don't want to win, win. I don't want that. I don't want people to... Do you want it to be uplifting? You have to earn the uplift. God, you have to earn it. Mm -hmm. But, well, I just feel resentful when I get to the end of a book and I'm just... And the main takeaway is how shit the world is, how incorrigibly yeah. shit the world is. Oh, yeah. thank or, you. Or how meaningless it is. I mean, that's such a cliche. It's easy. Mm -hmm. It's posturing. Yeah, yeah. I know there's a lot of meaninglessness in the world. I know there's yeah. a lot of incorrigible shit in the world. I just click open the Guardian website and there it is. Thank you very much. I've got that. I've got that. But what do you then do with it? What are the parts that are not incorrigibly shit? Uh, yeah. I want those. And You want people to feel better and that's a way of making the world better. Is it? It's got to be a start and it's got to beat the alternative. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's a, you know, anything you do, should, you should try and make the world a better place. Why not? Why make it a worse place? Why? Why? Mm -hmm. what, what, that's easy. Kind of. So those little, slightly twee, uh, notices you sometimes get on sort of certain airline washrooms where it says, "Please do something that makes this room one thing nicer than yes, uh, how it yes, was when you walked yes, in." Actually, yes. I've never seen that in an airplane, so I, um, I, uh, I don't even know why I said airline. But um, but that attitude. Yeah, yeah, actually, what's wrong with that? Yeah. Why not? Why the hell not? Um, uh, but, it's, you know, I, I don't want to end on a sappy note, but, uh, you know, I think, I think books, reading, uh, what I'm doing, I hope helps people to communicate better, and communication means maybe there's not so much war in the world and 
there. I, I, yeah, it's, books are good. Yeah, um, I think they they nurture emotional intelligence. This it's a bit of a buzzword, but but what's wrong with buzzwords when it's apt and true? Um, it's maybe a it's a knife sharpener for for critical thinking, non-fiction also, and it might, and it also sort of depends on the quality of the book. I mean, lots of books might also be um, um, blunters of critical thinking, but maybe not most. Um, mm. They might help people spot a conspiracy theory when it comes their way. Uh, yeah, I think mostly they're on the side of the angels, the angels of our better natures. Over. Very good. <laughs> Are we over and out? I think we're over and out, yeah. Oh, that's such a pleasure, Nigel. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, I'm... Uh, official handshake of the mic. Yeah, yeah. I'm actually a bit exhausted, I must admit. Uh, I really like that. I think you were on exhaustion high. I think um, it was... It was... Ever so slightly stonery, but in a really... But in a good, rigorous way, um, and uh, maybe we said things that are true, but which we wouldn't necessarily say in had we both got nine hours sleep. Let's get a tea and a coffee. I think, yeah, I, th I think there's a Catholic store. Oh, it's there. Okay, great.